things. Um, let's pray and let's ask God for his help and then I will give you an idea of what we, we're going to be up to this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to hear from your word this morning. Uh, thank you for the privilege we have to sing praises to you, to enjoy music and song together, to hear the reading of your word, uh, to speak to you um, in a public way, to confess together that you are our Lord and our King and our Savior, to confess together that we belong to you and that we want to follow you. Lord, as we look at this passage this morning, we pray for your help. And we pray that you would teach us and guide us and help us. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, as you, many of you will know, some of you may be new, and um, I'll explain what we've been up to over the last few weeks. But many of you will, will have been part of our series uh, where we've been trying to um, understand again uh, what is our identity as a church community. Who are we? Uh, what is unique about us? Um, obviously, many of us will identify ourselves as members of a particular family or a particular culture or a particular ethnic group, a particular country. Um, we hold on to those uh, sense of identity, that sense of identity. Uh, we are a, a particular name, uh, we belong to a particular family, and we represent a particular culture. And for most of us, that is primarily how we see ourselves. Um, that is how we think of ourselves in, in our world, in our, in our lives, in our daily existence. But what we've been trying to understand is that those things are not wrong or, or not true of us. We are part of a family, part of an ethnic group, part of a particular culture or country, or we're from a particular country. None of those things are not true. But if we are Christians, if we have put our trust in the Lord Jesus, then the primary ways in which we must identify ourselves are different. We are part of a family, uh, we are part of a particular culture, and, and we have a particular heritage. But as Christians now, we look beyond all of that in one sense, and we say, no, we are now primarily together as God's people, a redeemed family of servants. Those are the three words we've looked at so far. The next word that we'll look at today is, is on a mission, a mission, but we have been speaking about the fact that as Christians... As people who have put their trust in Jesus, we have been rescued, we have been redeemed, we have been set free uh, from sin and from bondage to sin, we have been forgiven, uh, we have been loosed from the power of sin and the penalty of sin in our lives. And that's been done through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a redeemed people, we are a rescued people, a price has been paid for our rescue, for our redemption. We are now free to live a new life. But we also spoke about the family, part of this identity, this new identity that we have. Um, as I said to you, we are part of families, most of us, and we, we identify with that particular family. And there's nothing wrong with that. But now, we are over and above that members of a bigger family. We are now connected to Christ. We are in Christ as redeemed and free people. And we are now members of his family, brothers and sisters together in his family with the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of this family. He is our elder brother. Um, he introduces us to this new family, and it's because of him that we are part of this new family. And so there's a unique way in which we operate together as people who love one another, as people who are concerned, not just for themselves, but for the other members of the family. Obviously, there's a worldwide Christian family, but as a local expression of the family here, we need to operate differently, function differently, see ourselves differently. We are members of a family. We belong to one another. And so a life of love is seen amongst us. And of course, we spoke in the last two weeks about the fact that the other aspect of our identity is that because we are rescued and free and redeemed, because we are family, because we belong to one another, we are children of God and we, we love one another, because of that, we are now servants to one another. Remember the catchphrase from, uh, John, from Mark chapter 10, where we, are, we were told that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. 
Remember, the disciples were clamoring for position. They were trying to get the best place. I think it was James and John. And they were trying to get a place on either side of Jesus. The other disciples were fed up because they thought, why didn't we get in there first? And Jesus said, that's not the kind of life you are to live as redeemed family. The kind of life you are to live is the life that Jesus lived. A life of service. A life where we don't look out for number one. We look out for one another as Jesus looked out for us. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The ultimate expression of his service to us was his death on the cross in our place and on our behalf. We are to love in that way. We are to serve one another in that way. So the focus has been on us as a redeemed family of servants. We're a community. We're a family. We are rescued, redeemed, servants to one another. And the attitude amongst us must be one of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. One of humility when we realize we are no better than anybody else. One of belonging. We are part of this family. And one where we look out for the well-being of other people. Remember the picture painted last week in Philippians chapter 2, where we are united. We live a life of unity and love. We're in the same, we're in the same boat together. We're on the same page. We're pulling in the same direction. We have the same vision together as God's family and God's people, rescued and redeemed, serving one another. Now, of course, the danger in all these things is that we become wrapped up in ourselves as a community. We become wrapped up in who we are as a redeemed family of servants. And so our life is kind of focused around getting things right here and making sure that everything's in order on the home ground. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's where it starts. But as uh, Matthew ends his gospel here in Matthew chapter 28, he pushes our vision beyond the four walls of this place and beyond the people that make up this church. He pushes our vision beyond uh, the belonging and beyond the family uh, to people on the outside, to all nations, in fact. He says, all authority is given in heaven and on earth has been given. Go and make disciples of all nations. God pushes us. Jesus pushes us to think beyond us as a family. He pushes us to think how this family that is operating as a redeemed family of servants can be a light to the nations, can be a light in a dark place. Let me read to you from John, sorry, I've got so many things on this pulpit here, yeah? um, John chapter 20, 17, and Jesus is praying for us, he's praying for future followers of himself, and he says the following, my prayer is not for them alone, this is John chapter 20, uh, chap let me try that again, John chapter 17, and we'll start at verse 20, just listen to it, or if you want to turn to it, that's great. Um, John chapter 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. And he's talking about his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. See, the purpose of us as a redeemed family of servants is that we are meant, by the way that we live together, to convince the world that Jesus has come from heaven, that he is God, that he is the Lord. That is the role that we play as his family. The point of our lives, the point of our existence is not us. The point of our, of our existence is that we might enjoy and celebrate life together, a life that is attractive to the outsider, a life that brings attention to the Lord Jesus Christ, and a life that makes it uh, possible or a life that makes it attractive uh, to trust in Jesus and to be part of his family. Well, as I said, Matthew gets to the end of his gospel, and he does exactly that. He pushes our, our minds and our hearts beyond uh, the borders of the church family, the redeemed family of servants. He has spent much of his time speaking about redemption. He's encouraged us in Matthew 11 to come to him, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and he will give us rest for our souls. He's encouraged us to be part of the family. You may remember his family, his earthly family came to him. They thought he'd gone mad. And they said, 
and the, 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 the disciples said, your family, your mother and your brothers are outside calling for you. He said, who is my mother and my brothers? It's you, my followers, the people who trust me. That's the new family. Matthew chapter 20, he quotes exactly the same story as Mark chapter, um, chapter 10, where he says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. A life of service, a life of ministry um, is what we are called to. But ultimately, as I've said already, that life of service, that redeemed family of servants is all about the other person. It's all about reaching out uh, to the world that we live in. There are three things that I want to focus on. Like all good uh, Christchurch sermons, we have three points. Wouldn't want to break with tradition when the boss is not here. But we have three points. And I'm going to mention, first of all, just again, the authority of Jesus here. Secondly, our job description or our mandate. What are we called to as God's people? And then finally, a promise that Jesus leaves us with. So first of all, let's look at the authority of Jesus in verse, uh, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's where he starts his final statement of, of command to, to these disciples. Now, you and I live in a, a world where Jesus is not unique. He's one of many. Uh, he is a, a person that we can choose to follow or not choose to follow as it suits us. Every religion has equal claim. Every faith has equal claim on our attention. We cannot put ourselves above anybody else. We cannot claim to have anything unique to say to the world. We live in a rainbow nation. And part of that rainbow nation, we are told, is that everyone is equal and all religions and faiths are equal. Now, I'm not saying that uh, all of us are not equal. But I want us to take note of what Jesus says here. And remind ourselves this morning of who Jesus is. What is, his, what is his identity? Who is he? Are we the masters of our own fates? Are we autonomous? Are we independent? Can we make up our minds about what we believe, what we think, what kind of life we live? Can we do it on our own? What does Jesus say here? Well, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. That means that there is no square inch of this planet, of this universe of existence that is not given to Jesus. He, is, he has authority over all of it. He is the Lord of every aspect of it. There is nothing outside of his rule and his kingship. There is nothing that escapes his attention. He is in charge. He is the Lord. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to him. You may remember the passage from last week, Philippians chapter 2. And part of that is describing Jesus' service. He gives himself over to death, even death on a cross. From being God, he did not consider equality with God something to be held on to. But he gave that up for a time. He became a man. He became a servant. He died, even a death on the cross. And it goes on to talk about how Jesus has been exalted to the highest place, that at the name of, of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess on the earth, over the earth, under the earth, that he is the Lord, that he is the King. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, if you read that, you will find that Jesus is described as the creator of all the universe, as the owner, as the sustainer of life, as the head of the church, the firstborn, the supreme one in every aspect of life. Both in creation and in the church, Jesus has authority. He is the Lord. And in every sphere of life, he has the supremacy. He is the supreme one. I want to read a few verses from Acts chapter 17, where again, Jesus' authority is in focus. Uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 29 to 31. Therefore, since we are God's offspring... We should not think that the, that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Why? For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. And he has given proof of this by, uh, to all men by raising him, the Lord Jesus, from the dead. 
Who is the judge of the universe? Who is the Lord of all? It's Jesus. And he has been proved to be the judge and the Lord by his resurrection from the dead. He assured us that he would rise again, and he certainly did. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. So where does that place us in the overall scheme of things? That place us, places us under his rule, under his authority, whether we like it or not. And there's a sense in which we can willingly submit to him and trust him and choose to follow him. Or there will be a day when we will give an account to him. And we will be forced to fall to our knees and submit to him as the king of the universe. And we will face judgment because we have rejected him and refused to submit to him. That is the reality. All authority on heaven and in heaven and on earth is given to the Lord Jesus. He is the chief. I don't know what other words to use to describe it. He is in charge. He is over and above everything. I would encourage you this morning to recognize that again, to recognize his authority, to put your trust and your confidence in him and be reminded that he is in charge. He gets to call the shots. Let's move on to the second point where Jesus lays down our job description. Here we have the Lord of the universe giving us the church, his people, God's people. We have him telling us what our job description is, what we need to be doing how we need to be living our lives. Well, again, when we talk about a job description and we talk about the job description of the church, everyone will be very happy to tell you what they think the church should be doing and how they think the church should be, should be functioning and whether they think the church is doing a good thing or a bad thing. People are generally pretty happy to express their opinion on the matter. There will be some that will be very strong and say the church should be the moral compass for our country and for our world. That's the role of the church, should tell us what is right and wrong. There will be others that will call us as the church to fight for justice. That is the primary thing that we do, and especially to fight for justice for the poor. There are those that see Christianity in, in no other terms than to fight for the poor and to be on the side of those who are downtrodden. Others will say, religion is a private matter. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. Don't interfere. I don't want to hear about your God. I won't tell you about my ideas. Let's just get on with it. And you don't interfere with my life, and I won't interfere with your life. Of course, there are others that are very happy to interfere with the life of the church and um, persecute and, and put pressure on the church. But certainly, there are a whole range of different ideas about what the church should be doing and how the church should be functioning. Again, it's a matter of deciding who we're going to listen to. Are we going to listen to all the voices that vie for our attention uh, in the modern world, both in the church and outside the church? Or are we prepared to listen to the Lord Jesus himself, to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given? Well, what is the mission that Jesus has for his people, for his church? And again, I have to tell you there are three things I wasn't going to mention under his mission because Jesus says that there are three things that we need to take note of in terms of his mission. He says there, verse 19, because I have been given authority, I'm telling you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. What are the aspects of our job description here? The first thing is that we are to make disciples of all nations. Now, I'm sure you've, you've heard over the last few weeks, but the word disciple simply means follower. It simply means somebody who follows. A disciple of Jesus is a follower of Jesus. So our mandate as the church primarily is to encourage others to follow Jesus. We are to make disciples of all nations. That's what Jesus tells us to do there. We are, encouraged, we are to encourage them to follow Christ, to put their confidence in him, to trust him. And we are to encourage them to grow up in Christ, in the family of God, and continue to put their trust in him in their lives. In the language that we've been using, we are to encourage people to be redeemed, 
We are to encourage them to be rescued by Jesus and to put their trust in him. We are to encourage them to be part of the family of God, part of this ident- new identity, this new belonging that we have because we are connected to Christ. And we are to encourage each other to be servants uh, together as we look after each other. But we have a mission, and that mission is to make disciples of all nations, encouraging others to be a part of this redeemed family of servants on a mission. We have thrown around the phrase, disciples uh, who make disciples. That's what we want. We want people who become followers of Jesus, who encourage others to become followers of Jesus, who, become, who encourage others to be followers of Jesus. It's not my job up here It's primarily to encourage you to follow Jesus and everybody else around you to follow Jesus. I encourage you, you in turn encourage others to follow Jesus, and they in turn encourage others to follow Jesus. It's a matter of us encouraging others to follow Christ and encouraging us others to grow up into Christ, into maturity and completeness as members of God's family, as servants together who are on a mission. That is the job description. That is the task that Jesus has given us here. He calls us also to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, baptism is really a public way in which we include people into the Christian family. And what he's saying here is you are to include people into the particular family that he mentions here, the Trinitarian family, the family of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, not any family. Not a family that is according to our own choosing. Not somebody who we can adjust according to what we think. This is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We do baptize, include people into this family, this unique family where Jesus is the one who has authority, where the Spirit dwells in us, and where the Father rules from heaven. That is the family into which we are to encourage people. And then the third thing there, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. One of the things you'll know from our church, if you've been here for any length of time, is that the Bible is at the center of what we do. And part of the reason for that is that here we are told by Jesus to teach others to obey everything that he has commanded us. So when we get together, we are not sharing our own ideas. We are not sharing our own thoughts or our own opinions on how things should be. We are submitting ourselves to the Lord of the universe. We are making disciples as we teach each other and as we admonish each other. And again, this isn't only the responsibility of those who stand up here and teach. If you go to Colossians chapter 3, 4, you'll find that there we are told to admonish and encourage and teach each other with all wisdom. The Word of God needs to be at the center of our lives, of our relationships, of the way we operate together, of the agenda and the the priorities that we have. That is our philosophy of ministry here at Christ Church, and we believe it is a biblical philosophy. We change the world by teaching the gospel, by teaching God's Word, by teaching the world and encouraging the world to submit to everything that Jesus has taught us as we find it in the Word of God. That is how we operate, and that is how we will continue to operate, because we believe it is the power of God to save us, and to rescue us, and to bring us into His family, and to include us in this wonderful uh, servant uh, kingdom, this wonderful kingdom with a mission, this wonderful family with a mission that God has. Now, a couple of queries may be raised in your head as we think about that. Why the fuss People really struggle with this in the world that we live in. They don't understand why we would want to encourage outsiders to to follow Christ. Why can't you do what you want to do, and why can't the rest of us just carry on with our lives and live our own lives and follow our own path? Why is it such a big issue that we would want to encourage others to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, again, we need to recognize that He is the Lord of all creation. And ultimately, we will be accountable to him. And if we do not trust him and find forgiveness and hope and life in him, then we face death. We face judgment. And that is why we are desperate to get this message out. We don't want to have that message for ourselves and keep it to ourselves. We want to share it with the world. 
If a great disaster is coming and you have the solution to that problem, you'll want to share it with the world. Obviously, we don't do it in a foolish way, in an unwise way, but our heart is saying we want this message to spread. We want others to come to know this, this Jesus who has authority in every aspect of, cre of creation and of life. We want others to find forgiveness. We want others to be rescued and redeemed and become part of this family, become servants together with us as we fulfill our mission and our mandate as God's people. We cannot keep this message to ourselves. And that is why the first part of our identity, the redemption, rescue, will always be a key part of what we do. We will never stop calling people to trust Christ. We will never stop encouraging you and encouraging me to make sure that we lived in such a way that others will want to follow Christ and want to hear the message of the gospel. There will be lots that hate you for it. There will be lots that don't want to have anything to do with you. But we will never stop encouraging you to make this message known. Another question that comes up is, is this only for the disciples or for those with special gifts or for those who stand up front Sunday by Sunday and do great things, supposedly? Is it just for us? No, it's not. If you look through the Bible, you'll find that we are encouraged as God's people, all of us, to pray for this work to continue, to pray for those who preach the gospel and share the word. We are encouraged to be wise in the way we act towards outsiders in Colossians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 2, we are encouraged to shine like stars in the universe. We are, we are called upon, all of us, together, uh, to be a witness, to be a testimony, to make this gospel known in the world through our lives, through our speech, through the way we live, the way we interact with the world out there. Titus talks about the fact that we must live together to make the gospel attractive to others so that the others will be drawn into this, this redeemed family of servants on a mission so that others will want to put their confidence and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look next week in more detail at how this relates to our daily lives. It can sometimes feel that, okay, if we are meant to make disciples, we must all leave our jobs and go and be missionaries uh, in, all, in, in all different parts of the world. And there may be some of you that God calls to do that, and that's a wonderful thing. But there are all sorts of ways in which you and I, as everyday people, will be able to share this message and make disciples, either by supporting missionaries, either by supporting a local church, or playing a particular role in a local church, or being involved in a mission organization or a mission trip. We'll be talking about that over the next while. Getting involved in the lives of others. In the way we interact with people from day to day, that is where we, we can be a witness. That is where we can make the gospel attractive and encourage people to put their faith and confidence in Christ. So we're encouraged to make disciples. We're encouraged to baptize people into this faith, and we are encouraged to teach the gospel uh, as we do that. A final quick comment, the promise that Jesus leaves with us, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's a daunting task. There are how many, however many billion people on the planet. Many of them had not even heard the name of Christ. Many of them have not had opportunity uh, to be called to trust Jesus. There's persecution and opposition for those who will try in their daily lives to share Jesus with others. The task seems overwhelming. Maybe you're depressed and discouraged by the fact that you've lived alongside people for years and there's been no change, no interest in the gospel, no concern for Christ in their lives. Maybe you've allowed your own selfishness and sinfulness to get in the way of God's mandate for your life. The promise is that God will be with us that Jesus will be with us to the very end of the age. And we know that he is with us through his Holy Spirit, as he is amongst us, as he is in us, to strengthen us, to help us, to keep us focused on what is important. Our response in all of that is to take Jesus' words seriously, to, to be determined to live out our Christian lives so that we can make disciples of others, live, so that we, to be determined to live as redeemed family of servants, being like him, pointing others to Christ, and in turn, trusting him to do that, trusting him to use us and work through us so that many will be in, in, involved, many will be absorbed into this redeemed family of servants who are on a mission. 
Let's pray that God would help us to stay focused on that great task. As we pray, we, we're coming to the Lord's table this morning, and I'm going to ask the stewards if they can just come forward during the prayer, um, and then we will continue with the service. Eddie's going to lead us in the communion. I'm heading off to Tembisa, um, but let's pray, and let's ask God uh, to help us. Father, we recognize that so often we adopt our own agenda for life, and today again, certainly I've been challenged to recognize you as our King and our Lord and our Master, and I've been encouraged again to trust in you and to adopt your mandate for our lives and for my life. Lord, please help us uh, to take you as our Lord and our King in practice, not just in theory, and to follow you with all of our hearts and to recognize you as our King and our Lord and our Master. And to seek to make disciples of others as we live out our daily lives. Please help us. Give us the strength we need by your spirit to stay focused on the task. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.